All right, good morning. good morning. So as it would happen, there was a particular flight where a priest was sitting right next to a rabbi. And they're traveling along at 30,000 feet, and after a while, the priest turns to the rabbi and says, uh, is it still a requirement of your faith to not eat pork? And the rabbi says, uh, yes, that's, that's still part of our laws. And the priest leans in close and very quietly says, so I got to ask, have you ever eaten pork? And the rabbi leans in close to the priest and says, well, actually, yes, on one occasion, I did succumb to temptation and I ate a bacon sandwich. And the priest nodded with this understanding and knowing and went back to his reading. A while later, the rabbi leans over to the priest and says, uh, Father, is it still a requirement of your church that you um, remain celibate? <laughs> and he says, uh, yes, yes, rabbi, that is still very much a part of our faith. The rabbi leans in a little closer <laughs> and says, so tell me, Father, have you ever... Uh, fallen to the temptation of the flesh? The priest leans in really close to the rabbi and says, well, you know, rabbi, on one occasion, I was weak and broke the pledge of my faith. And the rabbi nodded and had this incredible look of understanding. And he remained silent for a few minutes. And then the rabbi leans into the priest again and says, Sure beats a bacon sandwich, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are you thinking? Okay. I'm going to talk today a little bit about Abraham. Abraham is a really, really interesting person in the Old Testament. And one of the things that I think that makes him so interesting is that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all claim kinship to Abraham. So he was clearly a big player. He was a big dude in the Old Testament. Um, now, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they start out as Abram and Sarai. Uh, these are not perfect characters, but the important thing is that they are faithful and they're smart, which is really important. These are faithful people and they're smart. So God's promise to Abraham is you will be the father of a great nation. Holy cow, that's a lot, right? You're going to be the father of a great nation. Now, God promises land, descendants, and a blessing that, that, that Abraham will be a blessing to other nations. Now, when this happens, Abraham is 75 years old. So the opportunity, I think, for doubt, for a lack of faith, is very high. But th that's not Abraham. That's not his way. So metaphysically, Charles Fillmore in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary says that Abraham represents the first step in the redemption of man from mortal to spiritual consciousness. That Abraham is that first step where we're spiritualizing our consciousness, where we're leaving the world of saying, I am dictated, I am guided only by my five senses and the world around me. What I'm guided by is this presence, this principle, a power of the living spirit that is within me. That's what I'm going to follow. And of course, this is still true today. So remember, when we talk about people in the Bible here in religious science, they all exist within us. So Abraham is that part of us that starts the journey to really follow the guidance of the indwelling spirit as opposed to going and looking out to the world or stepping out into the world and getting agreement for the, from the world as to how we should be or what we should do with our life. So this is, this is really an epic story. This is an epic story. Abraham is known as the father of the Hebrew people because under his leadership, a group separated itself from the other Semitic tribes and settled in Canaan. And so the Bible refers to their descendants as Hebrews, which was the racial name, Israelites, which was their religious name, and Jews, which was the name given them about the time of the Babylonian captivity when all the Hebrews were from Judah, hence Jews. Mm -hmm. So Abraham is the first step from mortal five-sense consciousness 
to spiritual consciousness, right? That he is the beginning of faith that's willing to follow the guidance of God within and go forth into a new land, right? Because he's going, he's going to go to a new land. That new land is a, a symbol of a new consciousness. You know, Jesus says in the New Testament that in my Father's house are many rooms. There are many states of consciousness. There are many rooms in consciousness. Now, they were called Abram and Sarai before God calls them to their greater yet to be. But imagine, 75 years old, and God speaks to him and says, I have plans for you. You're going to do some amazing, amazing things. See, so one of the things that this implies is that humanity is mature in our understanding before we're aware of the spiritual guidance and direction that comes from within. That there's a level of maturity and understanding that we have to have before we can actually be guided by spirit. So Jehovah says to Abraham, you know, get out of this country un uh, unto the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Wow, that's a big promise, right? So a new land is a higher realization of truth. We have to be willing to leave what we know, our old understanding, our old way of being, perhaps old habit patterns, old tendencies behind in order to have the new. And I know how this goes for all of us, is that like, yes, I want the new, but I'm going to hang on to the old in case I don't like the new once I get it. You know, I want to, I, 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 yes, absolutely. Oh, I'm all about new. I'm all about better. I'm all about different. I'm all about God's good for me. Yes, absolutely. But I'm not surrendering what I currently have until I have some kind of a guarantee. And you know, you don't get guarantees. So often we want the new, but we're reluctant to relinquish what we currently enjoy. Hmm. So it says in Joshua, choose ye this day who you will serve. Am I going to serve my current good, or am I going to be open to serving what God has in mind for me that is, in fact, actually better? See, I believe that what we do so often is that we let our good get in the way of our better. You know, well, but this is pretty good. I'm pretty happy right now. You know, why should I mess with it? You know, what if it doesn't turn out as good as this? What if I actually am worse off, right? And so, so herein is, is Abraham as a great example for us of someone who has faith because he really does trust and believe that God intends good for him, right? So we, you know, but we can't have the blessing of the spiritual kingdom and still retain the old mortal consciousness, right? Because one cancels out the other. So it's, it's, it's impossible, right? We have to make a choice. I either want my current mortal consciousness and all that comes with it, or I want, I'm making a conscious choice for the spiritual kingdom. Where we have attained an Abraham state of realization, our faith in God is quickened. You know, so when you really believe that God is on your side, that God intends only good for you, that God is not separate from you, that there is actually a spiritual quickening that happens there. And we realize that there are two spiritual truths. And the first is that God wishes, uh, God intends to move us into a new land symbolized by a new consciousness. That the will of God for us all is to rise up in consciousness. Right? That uh, spiritual realization demands an entirely new viewpoint on everything. On God, on ourselves, on other people, people in our life close in, people in our life who are a little further out, on the environment that we live in, on our destiny, a new viewpoint is required. A more enlightened way of thinking is that we behold God as the creative life and ourselves as God's offspring, made in his image and likeness, and it's our responsibility to express God's attributes in the world. So Mother Teresa said it this way. She said, you are God's only hands on earth. You are God's only feet on earth. So if it's not you who's going to put God's love and God's energy and God's light and God's good into the world, how is that going to happen? Right. So I think our environment 
Science of Mind teaches us is a picture of our current state of consciousness. How your life is now has everything to do with your consciousness, is what I'm trying to say in the nicest way possible. Okay? So Science of Mind teaches us that we are involved in co-creating the conditions of our life experience. And so because we are involved in creating them, we are also involved in changing them. So our destiny is heaven, not heaven like a place that is real estate, that kind of a destination, but a consciousness of oneness with God. That is our destiny. So this consciousness, when we do our spiritual practice, when we pray, meditate, study, serve, tithe, when we do all of these things that we teach, when we do them consistently, we are lifted right, in consciousness and we receive the impress of God's grace. Ernest Holmes says that God's grace is the divine givingness of spirit, that spirit only knows to give of itself. And what does spirit give? Everything. God has given all. God has already given all that we could possibly want, desire, anything that we could receive. God has already given it. All right? And I know what you're thinking. You think, well, if God's given it, where the heck is it? Because I could use it right now. I understand. But see, the responsibility for our growth and unfoldment is placed on us in this teaching. This means there are no excuses. You know, you can have reasons or you can have results. And people I know are very, very committed to their reasons why things don't work for them, why their life is not the way they want it to be. They're very, very invested. They have a whole group of people in their life who are their support group for their reasons. You know, their backup team reminding them, you're right, you are dumb. <laughs> you are stupid. Life doesn't work for you. It works for everybody else, but not for you. You are so special. I'm here for you. Yeah, that's what they say. Or we could have results, you know? And I think the results, is, the results are the greater yet to be that spirit within us is seeking to express its qualities by means of us. That God's trying to put more joy into the world by means of us, more love by means of us, more creativity by means of us. That's how those things get expressed. That's how those qualities of God get expressed by us listening and saying, this is what I'm here to do. This is what I'm supposed to do right now. I think we, have to, we have to discard what does not serve us. So the, what I'll call the error habits of the past, the false beliefs, the old ways of being. What is adverse to our spiritual nature? You know, a destructive attitude of mind. It's got to go. Prejudice. It's got to go. Because, you know, if we don't let these things go, if we do not forgive, if we do not stop with the regrets, if we don't do that stuff, it's like we're telling the universe, I'm getting so much juice out of not forgiving my brother, sister, boss, ex, whoever. I'm getting so much value out of that that please, God, I will wait for my good. I will wait for my life to get better because this is just so juicy being mad at somebody else. This is just so rewarding. I mean, I revel in it constantly. My life, yes, my life is not as good as it could be. I realize it could be infinitely better. I could be infinitely happier, healthier, more peaceful, more abundant. But I'm still mad at what they did to me 40 years ago. And I'm just not going to let it go. That's just not smart. Smart like Abraham and Sarah. Because they were willing to leave everything they knew to start to travel toward a promised land to start to travel toward Canaan, a new room in consciousness. So for us, how I see this really, really works for us is that we have to discard what does not serve us. You know, those attitudes of mind, those ways of being. You know, there are things that we say about people that never need to be said again. There are things that we think about life and the world we live in that never need to be thought by us again. They are not worthy of us as expressions of the infinite spirit. You know, the world will continue to operate without your judgment and your criticism. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> God, because I thought all this time I was keeping it on track. I thought I was keeping it in line, you know? But the fact is, that stuff is what keeps my life down. That's what keeps me from being and doing and having everything that, has been, that I want, that has actually been promised by God. It's, it's, this, it's destructive to us. The second realization is that when faith is quickened, when, let me say this another way, whenever 
we do the work and we let go of something, when we heal something, when we really forgive someone, when we really forgive ourselves, when we stop telling the story, whatever that story is, when there has been a genuine healing within us, then God has a blessing for us, that there is newness that comes in because through that healing that we have achieved, space is opened up. And when that space is opened up, you know the universe abhors a vacuum. So God can bring something good into that space where we have actually done the work to forgive or let go or release somebody or let someone off the hook, where we stop telling that story about how we've been done wrong to so long for so many years. In that space of newness, God has a blessing. He says to Abram, I will make, the, make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and be thou and, and you will be a blessing to all people. So in the science of mind, it is fundamental to what we teach that God wishes to give us infinite good. Infinite good. That's hard to wrap our head around, isn't it? Infinite good. But God's blessing is not limited in any way. God's blessing is given fully, and God's blessing is as much as we individually can receive. We think, well, why don't I receive more? Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> censor, 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 because you're not nice. Okay, there, I said it. You know, there, I censored that in a nice way. You know, because you're unforgiving, because we're still resentful, because we're prejudiced, because we're hateful, all of those things. See, we think we can be hateful over here and prejudice over here and criticize this person over there and think that that's not going to have an effect on us. And that's completely not true. That's not how it works because the principle is that there's only one life. There's only one life. This life is God. This life is perfect. This life is my life right now. Ernest Holmes said that again and again. There's only one life. So it's not like you can have a brilliant consciousness at home with your loved ones and then go to work and be a big old farm animal. <laughs> right? You can't do it. You can't do it because consciousness is one. Consciousness is one. I know that's such bad news, isn't it? They're, oh, but I'm really loving with the people that count. No, it's that all people count. That's the message of science of mind, is that all people count. Everybody everywhere is our brother and sister because we are all connected on the unseen side of life. You know? Yeah, it is. I know, I'm on fire now because I'm thinking about fried chicken and greens. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I need is a little soul food on Sunday and I'm good, you know. So God intends for each of us infinite good. How good are you willing to let it be in your life? Right? So, so this... this the, the, the first two lessons I get from Abraham this time around is that I have to be willing to do my spiritual work to heal. And when I do that, God has a greater good to bring into my life. See, that's the carrot at the end of the stick, that I do my own healing work because my life gets better. My life gets better when I do my healing work. When I forgive, when I let go of a resentment, when I stop telling the story, whatever that is, when I say, you know what? This, this opinion I have is not even worthy of me as an expression of God. I just need to stop. I don't need to have an opinion about this, this situation, this person. I don't need to have, I just need to know God is present here because that's what we do in Science of Mind. I need to know that God is in this person, God is in this situation. It keeps it very, very simple. But remember, the great spiritual masters who were here on the planet, B Buddha, Moses, Jesus, all of them, they came to teach a spiritual truth that was very simple. Now, not always easy to practice, of course, but they all came to teach a truth that was very simple. In other words, you didn't have to have multiple PhDs to understand it. Like, anybody could do it, you know? Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Buddha said, watch your thoughts. If you actually watched what you were thinking and brought great awareness to that, you could become enlightened just by watching what you think. Oh my God, that's incredible. You know, Moses was given some laws for people to follow so that through their obedience to the laws, they could start to make progress in consciousness so that a greater good could ultimately be revealed for them. So I believe that God has infinite good. 
infinite good available to each and every one of us. And our job is one, to do, this is the lessons from Abraham, one, to go after those areas, those dark spots in our consciousness that we have yet to heal. And the benefit of doing that is that we get blessed, we get raised up, something new comes into our life, and our life gets better. Let's pray. So we, <laughs> thanks. So we come together in thought and consciousness now for just a moment to recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit. That that is the most true, real thing about us, is the activity of God within us. And so I know we're all connected with everyone everywhere on the unseen side of life. That in the mind and in the heart of God, there's only one, and we're all it. So I speak this word for each and every one of us, that whatever it is we need to let go of today, what we need to heal, what we need to release, what needs to be water under the bridge for us, we in fact surrender into that right now because our desire is to be a place where the good of God is revealed in a greater way. So I claim for each and every one of us today that we let something go, whether it's an idea or a belief or some way of being. And I know that the universe rushes in to fill that space, to bring us newness, to bring us an improved experience of life. So I claim for each and every one of us today, great healing is taking place. That we stand as open, willing vessels for God's good. And we include in our prayer our family members and friends and loved ones. We know that right where they are, wherever they are, whatever they're going through, God is present right there in the midst of that situation. God has peace, God has love, God has all needs met. God has perfect healing for everyone involved. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. And so all those things that pull at our attention, we remember God is present even in the midst of that. God is there as love, as healing, as right action, as harmony, as all needs met. And we bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are all blessed by being together today in consciousness that everybody gets raised up. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.